Welcome back to Deep Learning. And today I want to tell you a bit about attention mechanisms and how they can be employed in order to build better deep neural networks. Okay, so let's focus your attention on attention and attention mechanisms. So what is attention? Well, you see that we humans process data actively by shifting our focus. So we can focus on specific parts of images because they carry different information. And of course, for some words, for example, we can derive the correct meaning only by means of context. And therefore, you want to shift your attention. And the way how you shift your attention may also change the interpretation so you want to remember specific related events in the past in order to influence a certain decision. And this then allows to follow one thought at a time while suppressing information irrelevant for the task. So this is the idea. You only want to focus on the relevant information. One example that you could think of is the cocktail party problem where you have many different people talking and you just focus on one person and by specific means like by looking at the lips of that person you can focus your attention on the lips and then you can also kind of use your stereo hearing as a kind of beam former to only listen into that particular direction and then you're able to concentrate only on a single person the person that you're talking to using this kind of attention mechanism and we do that quite successfully because otherwise we would be completely incapable of communication during a cocktail party. So what is the idea? Well, you already seen those saliency maps and you could argue that we only want to look at the pixel that are relevant for our decision in order to make the decision. In fact, we will start not with images, but we want to talk first about sequence to sequence models. And here you can see a visualization of gradients from a CNN type of model that is used to translate from uh, English to German. And if you now start plotting those gradients, so this is essentially the visualization technique that we already looked at in image processing, you can now see the gradient with respect to that particular input of the respective output. And if you do so, you can notice that in most cases you see this essentially linear relationship. The English and German have, of course, very similar sequences in terms of words. But then you see that the actual beginning of the sequence, which starts with to reach the official residency of Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, is then translated to the offizielle residenz des Premierministers Nawaz Sharif zu erreichen. So zu erreichen is to reach, but to reach is first in English and it goes last in German. So there's a long temporal context between the two, but these two words essentially translate to those two. So we can use this kind of information that we can generate with these gradient backpropagation in order to figure out which parts of the input sequence are related to which parts of the output sequence. Now the question is how can we model this in order to boost the performance and let's look at a typical translation model. So what is typically done in sequence to sequence model if you work with recurrent neural networks, what you do is you have a forward pass in an encoder network and this receives some input sequence and from the input sequence, as we discussed earlier, then we can compute the hidden states H1 to HT. So we have to process the entire sequence in order to compute HT and then HT is used 
as a context vector for the decoder network. So HT is essentially the representation of the state or the actual meaning of the sentence. And then HT is decoded into a new sequence by the decoder network. And then this generates a new sequence of own hidden states that are S1 to ST prime. So note that the output, of course, can be of different lengths. So we have two different T, so we have T and T prime. And this also generates an output sequence uh, Y1 to Yt prime. So this allows us to model different lengths in input and output. Of course, you may have a different number of words in two different languages. So now when we actually do this decoding, then you see that we have to encode everything into this context vector. And this encoding may be very difficult because we have to encode the entire meaning of the sentence into one context vector. This may also be very difficult even for an LSTM. So the idea is now to introduce attention. And attention for sequence-to-sequence -sequence modeling can be done with a context vector. And the idea is now that we have this context vector HT. And the issue is that we had this context vector HT and it does not allow any access to earlier inputs because it was only obtained at the very end of the sequence. So the idea now is to provide access to all contexts using a dynamic context vector as combination of all previous hidden states. So here we see a bidirectional RNN, which does one encoding by a forward pass. So you start with x1 and create a hidden state 1 and go to x2 and so on. And then you run exactly the opposite sequence. So you start with xn and go to xn minus 1 to create another context vector, which is exactly from the backward processing of the same input sequence. This then gives you access to several hidden states. And those hidden states we can essentially concatenate from the two passes. And with those hidden states, we then want to do a linear combination with some combination weights alpha. So this is a weighted average of the different hidden states. So we multiply them with the respective alpha, add them up, and provide this as additional dynamic context for our decoder RNN. So the idea is that we want to generate these weights alpha using a dynamic procedure. OK, so let's look at how we can actually compute those alphas. And the idea that is presented in reference one is that you essentially try to produce alignment rates. So if the state is relevant for the current observation in the decoding, then you want it to get a high score. And if the state is not so relevant, then you want to give it a low score. So the alphas encode the relevance of the current state with respect to the currently produced output. And now you may argue, OK, so how can I actually generate this score? So of course, we can put it into some softmax function. Then they will be scaled between 0 and 1. So that solves the problem. So we can produce any kind of measurement of similarity. And we can actually propose different things here. What they propose in reference one is actually to do a score function. And now the score function is represented by a matrix W alpha and an additional vector V alpha. And these two are simply trainable. So we essentially use this property of universal function approximation that we don't have to set the score function, but instead we simply train it. So it determines the ideal alignment, which inputs are important for which outputs. And the nice thing is that you can also visualize those weights for specific inputs. 
So it allows also interpretation by looking at the scores and we're doing this here on the right hand side example. This is again a translation setup where we want to translate from English to French and you can see that now these alignment scores essentially form a line but there is some exceptions so you see that the European economic area is decoded into la zone économique européenne. So you can see that there is an inversion of the sequence and this inversion of the sequence is also captured in the attention by the alignment scores. So this is a very good way of how to compute the score function. There's different alternatives. For example, in reference seven, they have simply the cosine between the two states to form the score. You could generally have an inner product, a generalized inner product using some weight matrix alpha. You could have a dot product, which is essentially just the correlation between the two states. And then you could also have a scaled dot product that somehow also respects the size of the hidden state. So all of these have been explored. And of course, this depends on your purpose, what you're actually computing. But you can see that we are essentially trying to learn a comparison function that tells us which state is compatible with which other state. OK. There's different kinds of attention. There's soft attention versus hard attention. So far, we essentially had soft or global attention, which is fully differentiable, but it's not very efficient for large inputs. You can alleviate that by hard attention And here you fix on glimpses of the input. So you take out small patches, for example, from images and sample this from a distribution. This, of course, implies much lower computation times. But the sampling process is unfortunately not differentiable. And then you will have to look into other training techniques, such as reinforcement learning, in order to be able to train this. And this has a much higher compute time. So this is a certain drawback of the hard attention. There's also things like local attention that is a kind of blend where you predict the center position for the focus and the window or kernel. So let's see what we can do with that. Well, you can even do things like combining attention with image recognition. And there's a paper, reference 24, that is called Show Attend Tell. And Show Attend Tell actually has the idea that you want to have automatic generation of image captions and the different elements in their relationship in the image trigger different words. So this means that the attention mechanism is used to improve the caption quality. So how does this work? Well, you can see here now that we can compute the attention for a specific word. And here you see that the sentence that was generated is a woman is throwing a frisbee in the park and now we can relate the frisbee with this attention map and you can see that we are actually localizing the frisbee in the image so this is actually a very nice way of using the cnn feature maps to focus the attention for the respective decoding at the respective position so here's some comparison between soft and hard attention. And you can see that the attention maps that are produced softly, they are more fuzzy and are not as localized, while the hard attention looks at only small patches. Well, that's the way how we designed it. But both of these techniques allow us to generate better image descriptions. And the deterministic soft attention can be trained end to end. Well, for the hard attention, we have to train with reinforcement learning. Reference 24 shows that both attention mechanisms generate the same sequence of words. So it's actually working quite well. And you have this side product that you can now also localize things in the image. Very interesting approach. 
You can also expand this by something that is called self-attention. So here the idea is to compute an attention of the sequence to itself. So the problem that we want to tackle here is that if you have some input like the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired, then we would like to know whether it refers to animal or the street. And now the idea is that you want to enrich the representation of the tokens with context information. And of course, this is an important technique for machine reading, question answering, reasoning, and so on. So we have an example sequence here. The FBI is chasing a criminal on the run. And now what we do is we compute the attention of the sequence with respect to itself. And this allows us to relate every word of the input to other words of the input. So we can generate this self-attention. Why is this useful? Well, you can see that you can then also use this for machine translation. And the network that they propose is only based on attention. So there's no convolutions and there's no recurrence for machine translation. So attention is all you need. And the core idea is now to iteratively improve the representation by this self-attention mechanism. And this then gives rise to a kind of transformer architecture. So it has two core blocks in the encoder. This is the self-attention step and the local fully connected layer, which is then used to merge the different attention heads. So let's look at them in a little more detail. Of course, you need an encoder. We've already seen that for words, we can, for example, use one hot encoding, but this is a very coarse kind of representation. So this attention is all you need network learns an embedding algorithm. So it general function approximator to produce an embedding that is somehow compressing the inputs. And then it computes a self-attention for each token. So you could argue that you have a query token, a key, which is a description for the query, and you produce a value that is the potential information. And they are generated using trainable weights, WQ, WK, and WV. Then the alignment between query and key is a scaled dot product that determines the influence of the elements in V. So we can express this as a softmax of the outer product of Q and K. And this is then multiplied to the vector V to produce the attention value. Now with this attention, we actually have a multi-head attention, so we don't just compute a single attention, but uh, different versions of the attention per token. And this is used to represent different subspaces. And then these local per token information is recombined using a fully connected layer. This is then stacked in several attention blocks, actually, in reference 23. So this then allows a step-by-step -step context integration. And they have an additional positional encoding to represent the word order. So this is now the input embedding. Now, if you look at the decoder, it follows essentially the same concept as the encoder. There's an additional input-output attention step. And the self-attention is only computed on previous outputs. You could argue, why do we want to do that? Well, it allows for an integration of knowledge independent of the distance. This positional encoding still allows to learn convolution-like steps. This is extremely versatile. And extensions even allow pre-training completely of unlabeled text, as you see in reference 4. So reference 4 is the so-called BERT system. And BERT is generated completely from unlabeled text by predicting essentially the text sequence. And the BERT embeddings have been shown to be extremely powerful for many different natural language processing tasks. Really popular system in order to generate 
unsupervised feature representations in natural language processing. These systems then have state-of-the-art performance and much faster training times. Okay, so let's summarize attention a bit. Attention is based on the idea that you want to align or find out the relevance of input elements with respect to specific output elements. The attention scores allow interpretation. It allows to reformulate non-sequential tasks as sequential ones. And the attention alone is very powerful because it's a transformer mechanism. State-of-the-art techniques for many, many natural language processing tasks involve these attention mechanisms. It's very popular for machine translation, question answering, sentiment analysis, and the like. But it also has been applied in vision, for example, in Reference 27. Of course, attention is also used in combination with convolutions, but there's also the question whether attention layers can be seen also as replacement for convolutions, as shown in Reference 80. If it was a deterministic video game, it would be much more beautiful, because beauty is simplicity. Okay, so next time in deep learning, what's coming up? Well, coming up is deep reinforcement learning, a really cool technique. We will have a couple of videos on this, and we want to really show you this paradigm how to produce superhuman performance for playing certain games. So the strategy is that we want to train agents that can solve specific tasks in a specific environment. We will show you an algorithm to determine a game strategy from playing the game itself. And here the neural networks are moving beyond perception to really making decisions. If you watch the next couple of videos, you will also get instructions how to finally beat all your friends in Atari games. And we will show you a recipe to beat every human in Go. So stay tuned, stay with us, watch the next couple of videos. If you want to prepare for some exam with us, it would be good to look at the following questions. Why is visualization important? Something that everybody should know is what is an adversarial example. And also you should be able to describe the techniques that are used, gradient-based techniques for visualization, the optimization-based techniques, inceptionism, and inversion techniques. Why is it not safe to cut off your network after layer three and only keep the activations well of course they can be inverted if you know the network architecture so it may not be safe and anonymous if you store activations we have some links to further readings in particular the deep visualization toolbox is really useful and of course we have plenty of references reference page one page two page three page four page five page six, page seven, page eight, 27 references in total. So plenty of further readings, in particular, if you want to learn a bit more about the attention techniques that we kind of very coarsely only covered in this video, there's much more to say about this, but then we would have to go really deep into sequence to sequence modeling and machine translation which we can't cover in this detail in this class. So thank you very much for listening and hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.